In the Cubs Quotient, How the Chicago Cubs Changed the World by Scott Rowan, readers learn that the history lessons many students are taught in school are more myth than fact. The truth behind the real history is more interesting than what we thought we knew, that the good guys weren't always good, the bad guys weren't always bad, and the difference between the two is less than you might think. The Cubs Quotient is also the world's first book powered by Geoverse, a publishing tool that allows readers the opportunity to more fully experience the Cubs Quotient beyond the printed page. Born in Brooklyn, New York in 1899, Alphonse Gabriel Capone went by many nicknames as an adult, Snorky, King Alphonse, Big Al, and the alias Al Brown. But his most well-known moniker was one he earned while working as a teenager at a New York bar. Frank Galluccio, a local gang member, thought Capone insulted his sister and demanded an apology. When one wasn't offered fast enough, Galluccio went after Capone's neck with a knife. He missed Capone's throat but slashed his left cheek and neck, leaving him with the permanent scars and the nickname of Scarface. Official government papers would later describe Capone's scars as oblique scar of four inches across cheek, two inches in front of left ear, vertical scar of two and a half inches on left jaw, oblique scar two and a half inches under left ear on neck. Capone detested the nickname Scarface. Nobody dared use it around him. It was a lifelong reminder of a bar fight that he didn't win, a teenage mistake he could never forget. The rest of his life, Capone made sure as often as he could to have photographers take his picture head on or from his right side to hide the scars on the left side of his face and neck. Which is only one reason why this photograph was so unusual. Taken on September 9, 1931, this photo is one of the few that Capone allowed photographers to take that revealed his facial scars. But that is not why this photo became so notorious. Capone was enjoying a day at the ballpark, watching the White Sox and Cubs play in the annual City Series at Comiskey Park. In less than a month after this picture was taken, Capone's tax evasion trial began. But he wasn't about to let that get in the way of his entertainment. Capone was a sports fan. In fact, just days before his trial started, he was escorted by several of his bodyguards to the campus of Northwestern University, where the Wildcats football team played host to Nebraska. But no photographers captured images of Capone at that football game where the nation's most infamous gangster tried to fit into the crowd by taking seats more than 40 rows up into the stands. Bad seats would never do for Capone, however, when it came to seeing the Cubs take the field. Though known for his affiliation with the south side of Chicago, where the White Sox call home, Capone openly cheered for the Cubs and made sure that he and his son, seated next to him, had front row seats. Protection wasn't a concern for Capone at the ballgame. Seated next to his son was politician Roland Libonati, who spent 30 years as an Illinois congressman and senator. Behind Capone and his son sat a murderer's row of the gangster's hitmen, including Sam Golfbag Hunt, Fred Cowboy Frank Pacelli, and seated to the left of Pacelli, out of the frame of this photo, was Jack Machine Gun McGurn, who will forever be connected to the infamous Valentine's Day Massacre. Gabby Hartnett was Capone's favorite player, and Hartnett clearly wasn't scared off by Capone and his associates. When reporters asked Hartnett if it was okay for one of the most powerful gangsters in the nation to be attending a Cubs game, Hartnett simply replied, I go to his place of business, why shouldn't he come to mine? For baseball commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis, Having a player photographed joking around and signing a baseball for Capone was bad enough, but the player admitting to going to his illegal bars was too much. Landis sent a telegram to Hartnett, demanding that the Cubs catcher never pose for another photograph with Capone again, to which Hartnett replied, Okay, but if you don't want me to have my picture taken without Capone, you tell him. What Landis did not know was that Capone's connection to the Cubs was greater than anyone knew. In the Cubs quotient, readers learned that for the months prior to this infamous photograph, Capone had arranged for his henchmen to protect Cubs outfielder Hack Wilson during his record-setting season of 191 RBIs, a record that still stands today. Even more troubling than actively protecting Wilson, Capone had plans to force William Wrigley to sell the Cubs to him. Capone would use a frontman for his purchase of the Cubs, an individual who'd be accepted by the baseball community but knew that Capone was truly in charge. Who was the front man that Capone planned to use for this ruse? Gabby Hartnett. Some of the other connections between Capone and the Cubs 
include Capone's gang helping a Cubs executive in need, as well as maintaining a presence at every Cubs game thanks to one front office employee who is associated with Capone's outfit. All of these stories and many more can be found in The Cubs Quotient, How the Chicago Cubs Changed the World by Scott Rowan.